Hello and welcome to Pulse Pressure. My name is David Woodruff. I am the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. Let's talk a little bit about blood pressure and what information you can get from a blood pressure. You know, blood pressure is one of our vital signs that we take all of the time. And we're taking blood pressures and writing them down. And in many cases, we're really not paying a lot of attention to what those numbers mean, other than if it's really, really bad. So, uh, but there are a lot of things we can learn about blood pressure, especially for those of you who are working on a floor or in the intensive care unit, where we're looking for early signs that patients may be having some decompensation. So let's review some of the basics here about good technique. When we're taking a blood pressure and we really want to make sure that it's accurate, let's use, first of all, the left arm, if at all possible. There's times we can't use the left arm and we have to use the right. But the left is closer to the heart than the right is, and therefore we would expect that the blood pressure in the left arm would probably reflect what's happening at the heart a little bit more closely. We want to have that left arm at heart level when we're taking the blood pressure. So as illustrated here, they have the arm elevated on a board or on some kind of a surface while taking the blood pressure feet flat on the floor. So no crossing the legs, no crossing the feet, etc. We want them flat on the floor if the patient is sitting up. If patient's lying in bed, just have them uncross their legs in bed so that their legs are straight. We want to use the right size cuff. So often we'll have one cuff at the bedside, kind of a one size fits all. Let's take the big one, the, the large adult, uh, because we can wrap it around a few times on a smaller person and it will still give us a blood pressure. Okay, well, the wrong size cuff is going to make the blood pressure altered slightly. It all depends upon the patient, it depends upon your technique, but you're not going to get as accurate a blood pressure as you would if you use the right size cuff. Next, we want to have the arrow, okay, so you see the arrow illustrated here in the diagram, the arrow on the cuff is pointing at the artery. So we want that arrow pointing at the brachial artery so that we are making sure that the cuff is centered over the artery. So, so often we just slap that cuff on and take a blood pressure and we're not paying attention to some of these basics and that can alter the pressure that we are seeing even just a little bit. Might make the difference between an early warning sign and having that patient crash without you knowing. So what's the difference between the systolic and the diastolic? They tell you two different things. So let's take a look at our example here at the bottom and showing our blood pressure of 120 over 80. So kind of a typical blood pressure. The systolic part of the blood pressure reflects our cardiac output. Now think about what's happening here. The heart beats and you get the systolic wave, cardiac output. So changes in systolic are going to reflect changes in cardiac output. If the systolic is going up, cardiac output is going up. If systolic is going down, cardiac output is going down. Now, you have to keep in mind, too, that the vasculature will affect both the systolic and diastolic. But our main reflection here, the main thing that systolic is going to reflect is cardiac output. Secondarily, the vasculature. The diastolic is going to reflect the vasculature. So what's happening when the heart isn't beating? It's just the contraction of the vasculature, the vascular tone, that is maintaining our pressure. So the diastolic, when the heart is not beating, is going to be the pressure of the vasculature. So that'll tell you a lot about what's happening with your afterload. That's the resistance the heart has to pump against. What's happening with the vasculature? So if we have a blood pressure of 120 over 50, that would tell us that, wow, look at the vasculature. We're having some vasodilation here. And then we want to ask why. Why do we have that vasodilation? What's going on? Did the patient just get a blood pressure medicine or some other medicine that's causing vasodilation? Or maybe that patient is developing sepsis. When you take a look at our example here as well, you see that the blood pressure 120 over 80, if we subtract 80 from the 120, the diastolic from the systolic, we'll end up with what's called the pulse pressure. The pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic. 
Okay, so here is an example on an arterial line. So this is an arterial line. It's showing the blood pressure here, 123 over 58. And now notice that the, the uh, other number that's listed there, 76, that is the mean arterial pressure. Mean arterial pressure is different than pulse pressure. Mean arterial pressure is the mean amount of pressure, so the average pressure that's in the vasculature. So that's taking the systolic into account. It's taking the diastolic into account with also the heart rate. We have to give the diastolic a little bit more attention here because the diastolic time is longer than systolic time. Therefore, we're going to, in our equation, we would use the diastolic times 2 uh, plus the systolic divided by 3. So that would be our equation for mean arterial pressure. Okay, That's not what we're talking about here, though. Let's take a look at the diagram. It's showing the red line across the middle is the arterial line. It's showing a systolic wave up sweep and a diastolic down sweep. And you see at the very bottom of that diastolic and the very top of the systolic, those are the numbers we're concerned with. So in this case, it's 123 and 58. In order to figure out our mean, mean arterial pressure, that would be 76. But to figure out our pulse pressure, we're going to take 123, subtract 58 from it, and end up with our pulse pressure. So what does the pulse pressure tell us? The pulse pressure tells us about what's happening with our cardiac output and our vasculature. So let's take a look at three different numbers here. These are three different numbers in, a patient, in patients that we probably have to be concerned with because they're all hypotensive. So first of all, we have 90 over 70. This is kind of a typical looking hypotensive pressure. What's happening here is that the patient's compensatory mechanisms for this low blood pressure and the low perfusion state are kicking in and they're causing vasoconstriction. We see that by the elevated diastolic. So if we were to maintain a normal pulse pressure, we'd have 90 over 50. We don't. Instead, we have 90 over 70, so that diastolic is raised from what it should be in a normal pulse pressure. That's telling us that we have vasoconstriction, and in this case, it's probably a normal compensatory mechanism as a result of having this low blood pressure. So maybe the patient is severely dehydrated, the patient's in shock for some other reason, but it's illustrating a normal compensatory measure. Next, we have the 90 over 60. Now, I said before that the pulse pressure should be 40, right? So the difference between systolic and diastolic should be 40. So why is this normal? Why is this a normal gap? Okay, well, the gap here is normal because as we start going down with our systolic, the gap becomes a little bit more narrow. So now we have 90 over 60. The diastolic is not particularly low. It's not particularly high. It's just kind of there in the middle. And that's probably a combination of things, a combination of vasoconstriction and a combination of maybe some sepsis that's driving that diastolic down. Take a look at the wide one at the bottom. So here we have a 90 over 40. So we have a 50 millimeter of mercury difference between systolic and diastolic. You may take this blood pressure and not think a whole lot of it, but what it's telling you about is massive vasodilation. As the systolic goes down, as cardiac output decreases, we should have compensatory mechanisms kicking in, including vasoconstriction, to maintain that diastolic pressure. Here we do not. Instead, what we have is we have a low diastolic, indicating that we have vasodilation, in this case, probably as a result of sepsis. So let's take a look at this case study here. We have an elderly patient who was admitted with changes in mental status resulting in a fall. On further examination, it's determined that the patient has a urinary tract infection. Very common. UTIs and pneumonia are very common types of situations that can cause a change in mental status in our elderly population. After initial treatment with IV fluids and antibiotics, your patient's more alert but remains confused with occasional agitation. His vital signs are blood pressure 108 over 54. So again, just taking a look at that blood pressure, the systolic is okay. The diastolic, you may say, well, it's just a little bit low, no big deal. I'm not really worried about it. Okay, But what is our range here? We should be at 108 over 68, right? If we're maintaining that normal balance. 
and instead we have 54. So it's showing some vasodilation, some generalized vasodilation in this patient. Now, if the patient is receiving cardiac medications or medications that cause vasoconstriction, I'm sorry, vasodilation, then that would make sense. Heart rate's 98. Okay, the heart rate is high. Now, I know that normal is 60 to 100, but how many times when you're sitting at rest is your heart rate 98, okay? So, you know, we have a heart rate of 98. That's really a little bit high. It, our heart rate should not be sitting at 98 when we're resting, all right? So 98 should be increasing the cardiac output, yet the heart or the systolic is only 108. Hmm. So that's not making a lot of sense how those two things are fitting together. Respiratory rate's 24. All right, now we write that a lot. I see that in charts all the time that people write a respiratory rate of 24. A normal respiratory rate is not 24. Some people may have respiratory rates of 24 because they're breathing very shallowly and we need to get them up and around or we need to get them using their incentive spirometry. But that respiratory rate of 24 is a little bit high. Now again, we're looking at subtle things here. None of these things are grabbing your attention and knocking you over the head saying, hey, pay attention to me, right? Then we have a temperature of 36. Do the vital signs give any clues to why he remains confused? Well, let's take a look at this in a little bit more detail. If we were to dissect these things a little more, look at the systolic 108. We have a heart rate of 98. The systolic should be pretty high. I mean, we should have a decent systolic with a heart rate of 98. Remember that cardiac output is the function of heart rate and stroke volume. So if heart rate goes up, cardiac output goes up. But our indicator of cardiac output, our systolic blood pressure, is only 108. Then our diastolic is 54. Our diastolic is 54, and that indicates that we've got some vasodilation going on. Remember, this patient was admitted with an infection, and despite being treated with antibiotics, he may be septic. But what about that temperature of 36? Don't we usually associate a fever with sepsis? Well, if you look at the sepsis guidelines, it's either a high fever or a low fever, or low temperature, that's associated with sepsis. In some cases, our patient who becomes sepsis, especially the elderly, cannot mount a fever. And in fact, their temperature will actually go down. Speaking of temperatures, in a study done recently, we normally associate 37 with being the normal temperature. However, in a study done recently, they found that on average, people's temperature actually is 36.6. Hmm, interesting stuff. Okay, remember, systolic reflects cardiac output, diastolic reflects the vasculature tone, or in other words, the afterload. Thanks for joining me for Pulse Pressure. Until next time, now.